Hi there, my name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and I would like to welcome you to ECE 3084 Signals and Systems. So let me define a couple of functions. I'm going to define a function alpha, and it has a support of three time units. And this function starts at one, and then goes down to, let's say, minus two, and then say goes up to two, something like that. And now I'm also going to define a function beta, and beta will also have a support of length three. And let's suppose this function starts at minus three, and then goes up to minus one, and then the last bit of it is one. Notice there's something very special about these functions. They are piecewise constant, and the transitions are all equally spaced in time. That will let us do some tricks to make these computations that I'm about to do simpler, and I'll show you those tricks later on. All right, now suppose that I want to compute the convolution of these functions. I will take alpha and beta and convolve them. I know that the resulting function is going to have a support of length six. So to compute this convolution, I'll need to pick a function to be the one that I'll flip and shift. How about let's flip and shift this one? So let me draw it down here on a tau axis. So here's zero, minus one, minus two, minus three. So flipping it going this direction, I'll have one, and then I'll have minus two, and then it'll go up to two. And this is definitely not a work of art. Pretend that I did a better job of drawing all of this. I guess if this is one, maybe it should look a little something more like this. I'm not sure I improved it. Anyway, this horizontal axis here is a tau axis. So I'll indicate that this is alpha t minus tau. And as we increase t, this is marching along to the right, which feels a little strange, but remember this is a tau axis and we're plotting a flipped version of the function. So here we have no overlapping on the left. Now we need to start shifting this function in and then seeing what we get when we multiply the two functions and integrate that. So down here, I'm going to plot a new tau axis and start shifting this over. So let me try to line these things up. So here I'll have minus three, minus two, minus one up to zero. And then I'll have one, two, three, let me grab this whole thing, and then I'll drag it along to the right like this. So pretend these things line up much better than they actually do. What do I have here? This little section and this little section overlap. So I have minus three times one in this particular region, which in this particular region will give me minus three over a length of one. So when I integrate this function, I'll wind up with minus three. So let me plot a point over here at minus three. And let me remind myself, well, what was happening at zero? Well, it wasn't overlapping, so I might as well plot a point there to indicate that we're starting at zero. So let me get rid of this. All right, so let's scoosh this over another time unit. It's getting a little dicey trying to make sure everything's lined up here. So again, pretend I lined this up better. Anyway, now I have two of these little sort of time chips that are overlapping. Let's see, what do I wind up with here? Over this region, I have minus three times minus two, which gives me six. So this goes up to six. This is obviously on a different scale than I had earlier. What happens in this region? Well, I have one times minus one, which gives me a minus one. So each of these has length one, so when I integrate this, I'll wind up with something at five. Let's see, if this is going up to five, then I should probably move this minus three. So let me move it up here a little bit to try to make this more proportionally sensible. All right, let me erase this mess. And we'll pick up this little function here and scoosh it over again. Okay, and really for what I'm doing here to make sense, I shouldn't leave these little markers in here. So let me get rid of those. Minus three is still all the way down here and here's minus two and so on. So here I've got minus three times minus two, which gives me a minus six. 
Okay, here I have minus one times minus two, which gives me a two over this region. And here I've got one times one, which would be one over that region. Yeah, this would all work better with PowerPoint, or at least with graph paper. I'll have one plus two, which is three, minus six, which is minus three. So this goes down to the minus three again. Let's erase all this stuff again. Doot, doot, doot. You know the drill by now. Let's scooch this over here. So now we have two of these little time chips overlapping. So I'll have minus one times minus two, which gives me a minus two. And then here I have one times minus two, which gives me another minus two. So when I integrate that, I'll have minus four. Let me erase this stuff again, yet again, yet again. Scoosh it over one last time. Scoosh. All right, so now I only have one chip, one little time segment that's overlapping. In that segment, I've got one times two, which gives me two. Integrating that over length one gives me a two. Uh, let's maybe put that there. And then if I were to scoosh it over one more time, well, then I don't have any overlap. So then at that point, I would be back at zero. Now, what about what happens in between? Well, if you think about all of these functions, all of the in-between points, wherever I have the sliding function at, we're integrating constants. And if you're integrating constants, then you're going to get ramps. So all of these points wind up being connected by straight lines. All right, so that was a big pain. But if you do things the flipping and shifting way, you just kind of can't escape this. As an exercise for the viewer, you could redo this where you flip and shift beta instead of flipping and shifting alpha, and you should get the same answer. And you can do that because convolution is commutative. All right, now at the very beginning, I promised you that there would be an easier way of working this kind of problem than what we just did. And it comes from the fact that we have functions that are constant over these equally spaced time units. So you can actually treat this as an ECE 2026 style discrete time convolution problem. So what we can do is write down a little table where we'll pick one of the functions to slide along. Now, not flip, right? This is something different. And each time we slide it one time instance, we multiply it by one of these numbers as we're running down the page. So if we do something like that, I'll have minus three minus one and one times one. So I have minus three minus one, one. I'll write another row that shifted over one time unit, but now I'm going to multiply everything by minus two. So let's see, minus two times minus three will give me six. Minus two times minus one will give me two. Minus two times one gives me minus two. And for the last row, we move over one again. Minus three times two gives me minus six. Minus one times two gives me minus two. And one times two gives me two. And now what I do is I sum along the columns. So this will give me minus three. This will give me five. This will give me minus three. This will give me minus four. And this will give me two. And I'm really hoping that matches what we have up here. Oh, and it does. Minus three, five, minus three, minus four, two. And then we have zeros on the ends. Again, this only works because these little chips here all have the same length and time, and they're constant over those chips. Now, just for fun, I should be able to work this table the other direction. Let's see. So what I'm going to do now is I'll write 1 minus 2 and 2, but multiply it by minus 3. So I'll write minus 3. Minus 3 times minus 2 gives me 6. Minus 3 times 2 gives me minus 6. All right, here I have minus 1. So that's just flipping signs. So I'll have minus 1, 2, and minus 2. Again, shifting this whole line over by one time unit. Now it's a discrete time unit, thinking about this in a 2026 sense. And let's see, the last one is 1 times everything. So that's just this function. So I'll have 1 minus 2, 2. Again, summing the columns, I'll have minus 3, 5, 
minus 3, minus 4, 2, which is the same, so everything works out. So this way of thinking only works for these nicely, naturally discretized problems like this. Essentially what's happening is that the flipping and shifting method that we've looked at in this course involves integrating over a tau axis this direction. That kind of integration over tau is effectively happening vertically in this table. We usually represent it going down the table with increasing k instead of an increasing tau. And the reason we can't really use this kind of table technique for most continuous time problems is you would essentially need an infinite number of rows in your table because once we're in continuous time land, you're dealing with a continuum. And for that matter, these kinds of tables only work cleanly in 2026 when you have finite length sequences. We don't get into this too much in 2026, but if you have infinite sequences that are defined by a formula, then you usually have to do a flipping and shifting kind of approach in discrete land, just like we do in continuous land. We don't get into that in 2026, but we do in ECE 4270. All right, so in the next lecture, we're going to play with these functions again, except in that lecture, we're going to do some cross-correlations.